We're now going to develop the uh, develop a wave equation, and the wave equation is a good starting point for showing how various physical properties are associated with uh, wave propagation. And we're going to think of the subsurface as an elastic material composed of idealized little particles bound together by springs. And so, if we displace a particle, it will exert a pressure on adjacent particles and be pulled or pushed one way or the other, and uh, it'll be pulled back to its equilibrium position by some restoring force. And this phenomena of wave propagation that we're going to talk about, uh, we can break it down into to three characteristics, three basic characteristics. First, we we can note that the, the ground moves. Let's say we set off, uh, we create some disturbance at a source, source point. We get bang on the ground with a hammer, for example. We move the ground. That changes the density. And then we know that these changes of density are going to produce changes in, in pressure. So we expect that um, as the ground moves, the density changes. We should get changes in pressure. These pressure changes then should initiate uh, additional particle motion. And so that's kind of the basic, these are the basic characteristics which will develop quantitatively. We'll uh, turn these um, expressions into quantitative uh, expressions and then link them together in order to come up with this, uh, this wave equation. So, uh, you know, again, thinking in this idealized way of the ground being composed of idealized particles, uh, a displacement will create local changes of density. So if we displace um, this uh, grayed out row of particles here over to this position, this row of green particles here, a uh, distance uh, delta x, then we will have reduced the pressure in uh, this area and, and so on. Uh, so to help uh, visualize this and also to, to uh, develop the ideas quantitatively, what we're going to do is that we'll assume that we are dealing with a with a plane wave, and this is not too far from the uh, truth. You know, the ground moves, produces a change in density, and we get this plane wave moving. But you know, if the source is over here, we're looking at a wave front out here, and we're looking at a small area on the wave front. It's almost like this. It's almost planar. So. The curvature on the wave front is going to be relatively small, so this is not this is not uh, too much of an exception for us to make in, in developing these uh, initial ideas. And uh, so, if we do make this assumption that that uh, we have a plane wave, then this um, uh, change in density that we're uh, talking about up here should be equal to uh, negative the initial density, the initial density in this region here, we've take, taken these particles and moved them over here. This d chi dx then represents that uh, change in position. We can actually think of this as a change in volume relative to the initial volume because we're, we're, we're just going to make things simple. We'll also deal with a unit area, a surface of unit area on the wavefront. So d chi dx is effectively the change in the volume per unit volume. So now we have this first characteristic, this uh, delta rho is equal to minus rho zero d chi dx, and delta rho is the change in the density. Rho zero here is the equilibrium density, and we see that it's decreased based on the motion of the particles away from their initial equilibrium position. We produced a uh, decrease in density in that local region. The second characteristic is that uh, the particle motion will produce changes in pressure. And we can represent these changes in pressure as a function of the equilibrium density plus some change in density, as we've shown here. So we can take this uh, relationship here and we can simplify it by using a Taylor series expansion of P. And we'll just use the first two terms, and this would be a two term expansion expansion of p of rho, where rho is rho plus uh, rho zero plus delta rho, the equilibrium density plus the change in density. And this uh, pressure then would be equal to the initial pressure, the equilibrium uh, pressure, 
plus delta rho dp d rho, and then we're ignoring the higher order terms here, the d2p d uh, rho squared terms. And that gives us a delta p, the change in pressure then being equal to the change in density, times dp d rho. And uh, k delta rho, uh, in this expression over here, k is a constant for any given material. And we'll we'll uh, say a little bit more about what this constant is. Um, as we as we go on, but we have these two characteristics now. We have that the the density changes are um, produced by ground motion or particle motion, and we have the this change in density produces a change in pressure, and we have this constant of proportionality here, k. And the third characteristic is basically an outgrowth of Newton's second law, and that would be the force is equal to the mass times the acceleration. I think Newton express this in terms of the acceleration being inversely proportional to the mass and directly proportional to the uh, force. So in our plane wave, uh, again, we're selecting a volume of length delta x and uh, with area equal to 1. So our dy dz then would be equal to 1 in this case, just to make things simple. And so this yields an enclosed mass, rho z rho delta x, where this delta x is effectively a volume force. And it's undergoing this acceleration, d2 chi dt squared. So we have mass times acceleration, rho z rho delta x times d2 chi dt squared. And this will be the force perpendicular to the wavefront. So now we have these three properties. Uh, <clears throat> that we've just just developed, and we can see here that you know this we've we've got this uh, force. Um, we can express this force in terms of a change in pressure just just as easily. Uh, what we've done over here is we've multiplied the pressure here by a volume. So this delta x, remember, is a delta x times. Uh, an area, which we're letting equal to 1. And over here we have a length in the denominator. So this is basically change in pressure times area, which gives us a force. And then this force is just equal to rho z rho, as we noted in the development of characteristic 3, it's just equal to rho z rho delta x d2 chi dt squared. Again, this is a volume, so this gives us a mass. And this dp is a change in pressure that we've been referring to. So so now we have, uh, instead of F over here, we have dp dx, and, and the negative sign indicates a decrease in pressure because we, uh, you know, if you go back to the original diagram that we have, we had a uh, particle displacements were to the right, so we have a low density region uh, that we've produced, so we have get a, a decrease in pressure, and we can express this interchangeably with, uh, the reason we're doing this is we're going to substitute uh, property 2 back into this expression over here, but we're just uh, indicating that we have rho 0 d2 chi dt squared is equal to minus dp dx, or delta p delta x. Okay, so we have the three characteristics. We've modified the third characteristic, and in this uh, expression that we have down here below, we're substituting uh, 2. This, as we said we would, delta P is equal to K delta rho. So we have rho 0 d2 chi dt squared is equal to minus K delta rho delta x. So then we're going to substitute 1, this delta rho, which is equal to minus rho 0 d chi dx, for delta rho in this expression over here. So that gives us a rho 0 k d2 chi d x squared. So we have rho 0 d2 chi dt squared is equal to rho 0 k d2 chi dx squared. And that gives us, uh, this is our wave equation. So we have d2 chi, we have a relationship between the second spatial derivative and the second temporal derivative scaled by this, uh, the reciprocal of this constant k. And uh, this is what, uh, this is our one-dimensional wave equation. So the solutions to the wave equation generally are of the form um, some function of x minus vt. And all this means is that, that 
you know, since we have this plane wave propagating through the subsurface here, that we basically know, if we know this function f at one point in time, then we will know its shape for all points in time and space. And uh, so a couple other notes, this f of k, we could write this f of x minus vt as kx minus omega t, where k is a wave number here, in this case 2 pi over lambda, and omega is the angular frequency, 2 pi f. And this gives us a dimensionless, uh, basically gives us dimensionless arguments here. So that we have solutions of the general form, sine kx minus omega t, cosine kx minus omega t, e to the i kx minus omega t, for instance, we could have any linear uh, sum like a Fourier series, uh, sum of different uh, fractions of the sine of kx omega t and, and k sine cosine kx minus omega t. k also in this case would be omega over v and omega would be k times the velocity. Uh, by the way, this velocity, we're using little v here to represent the interval velocity. And we'll switch, switch over to a capital V later on, but for now we're going to use this as interval velocity. So this will be the wave propagation velocity. And uh, we'll be making a distinction later on between the wave propagation velocity and the particle velocity, the velocity at which those particles move that we showed earlier on. So the general solutions that we're dealing with, you know, as we mentioned, we could have a Fourier series, f of x and t. This could be in uh, space and time, would be a sum over i for these different coefficients here, a sub i, uh, cosine n k x minus n omega t plus uh, b sub i, sine n k x minus n omega t, and I should put an n in here, or an i equals zero to n. And so the general argument, x minus vt, and again, this is the interval velocity, so we have a wave which is moving through space with a velocity v. And we said that this function basically indicates that if we know what the shape of the wave front is, let's say at time t equals 0, and it has this shape, and we go along some distance uh, vt2, at time t2, and we're kind of wondering what this wave front looks like at time t2, it's going to look exactly the same as it did at time t0, but it's just going to be shifted by a distance vt2. So in this peak, in this particular case, is located at x1, moves over to x2. Now, we should point out, I guess, you know, at this point, I think it would be, we should point out that we are kind of ignoring the effects of spherical divergence. Uh, since we have a plane wave, we don't really have spherical divergence. We will incorporate that later on. Uh, we also don't have uh, absorption, so we don't have energy loss in the wavefront as it propagates through the medium. And that's, that's something else that we're going to have to incorporate into this representation. But for now, we're, uh, we've, we've got a, a, a simplified representation of the propagating wave field and if we know its position at one point in time, we know it for all points in time, t2. So this constant k, uh, we have our wave equation here, d2 chi dt squared is equal to k, d2 chi uh, dx squared. And um, <clears throat> this has that general solution. Chi, we're representing the particle uh, displacements in this case, chi e of x minus vt. If we take this uh, derivative, let's say we take this derivative with respect to x, we take the derivative, you know, we in a chain-like fashion here, so we take the derivative with respect to the argument x minus vt, then we differentiate the argument with respect to x, that is just 1. So we have x prime here, uh, chi as a function of x minus vt relative to x minus vt. And so, likewise, the second derivative just turns out to be x double prime. So for d chi dt, we have d chi of x minus vt relative to x minus vt. It gives us an x prime, but when we take the diff derivative of the argument, x minus vt, we get a minus v. So d chi dt is equal to minus v x prime. So that we have uh, d2 chi dt squared is equal to 
v squared chi double prime. And that gives us basically that v squared is equal to k. In this uh, relationship here, rearranging the terms so that we have the spatial second spatial derivative over here on the left, and the temporal derivative on the right, we have 1 over v squared d2 chi dt squared. k then is equal to the propagation velocity squared in this case. So we've developed our uh, wave equation. We've indicated what this constant uh, k is in this particular case, and it shows up in various forms. And the next time we're going to construct the wave equation by looking at variations of tension in a vibrating string, and we'll get some additional insights into the significance of k and the interval velocity and uh, so on, and we'll go, go on from there. We'll actually develop the wave equation uh, a, a couple more times. And, and uh, so uh, I, I hope this has uh, been provided some useful insights, uh, helped you understand uh, wave propagation and uh, uh, understand where this wave equation comes from. And uh, uh, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.